Good morning. I hope uh, you guys did not spend all of last night uh, celebrating the Red Sox victory, but uh, there's one more tonight. Okay. Let's see. I trust the quiz went, uh, went okay. Um, what I'll do today is uh, take off from where we left off take off from where we left off on uh, Tuesday and uh, continue our discussion of the uh, large signal and small signal analysis of our amplifier. So today, the focus will be on small signal analysis. So let me start by uh, re reviewing some of the material. And uh, as you know, our MOSFET amplifier uh, looks like this. One of the things you'll notice in, uh, in circuits, as I have been uh, uh, mentioning all along in this course, is that certain kinds of patterns I keep repeating time and time again, okay? And this is one such pattern, uh, a three-terminal device like the MOSFET with an input and the, the uh, drain-to-source port connected to uh, uh, RL and uh, VS in series in the following manner. This is a very common uh, pattern. Uh, there are several other common patterns. Uh, the uh, voltage divider is a common pattern. We keep running into that again and again and again. Um, the Thevenin form, a voltage source in series with a resistor, is another very common form. Uh, the Norton equivalent form, which is a current source in parallel with a resistor, is also very common. And uh, it uh, beho behooves all of us to be very familiar with the analyses of these things. Voltage dividers in particular um, uh, are just so common that uh, you need to be able to look at it and boom, you know, be able to write down the expression for voltage dividers. Um, I would also encourage you to go and look at uh, current dividers. When you have two resistors in parallel and you, if you have some current flowing into the resistors to, to find out the current in one branch versus the other very quickly, okay? The expression is very analogous uh, to the voltage divider, uh, divider expression. And uh, some of these very common patterns are highlighted in the summary pages in the, uh, in the course notes. So it's good to keep track of those and be extremely familiar with those patterns to the point where you see it, you, know, you should be able to jump up and shout out the answer uh, just by looking at it without having to do any math. Okay. So uh, here was an amplifier. And then... Uh, uh, we noticed that uh, when the MOSFET was in saturation, it behaved like a current source, and this circuit would give us amplification uh, while the MOSFET was in saturation. So we agreed to adhere to the saturation discipline, which simply said that uh, I was going to use my circuit in a way that the MOSFET would always remain in saturation in building things like amplifiers and so on. Okay, And by doing that, uh, throughout the analysis, I could make the assumption that the MOSFET was in saturation. Okay, I didn't have to go through, uh, both the analysis became easier. I didn't have to figure out, you now what region is the MOSFET in? Well, uh, because of my discipline, it's always going to be in saturation. But in turn, what we had to do was conduct a large signal analysis. <clears throat> Again, um, in, in follow-on courses, you will be given circuits like this. In fact, uh, this very circuit with a very high likelihood, and you'll be given, uh, you'll be looking at more complicated models of the MOSFET. Or uh, you may be given a MOSFET like this, and let's say uh, in that course, the, the designers do not adhere to the saturation discipline, in which case you have to first figure out, you know, is my MOSFET in its triode region or in the saturation region? And depending on the region it is in, you have to apply different equations. Okay, so, so it's one step more complicated than in 002. In 002, you know, we simplified our lives by following a discipline. 
Okay, and let me tell you that following a discipline is quite okay. Okay, but it simplifies our lives and we can do good things with it. It's quite okay to do that. Okay, we're not wimps or anything like that. It's, you know, it's quite okay to have a discipline and, and agree that we're going to play in this region of the playground and build circuits in, in that manner. So uh, by doing so, uh, we could assume the MOSFET was in saturation all the time. And an analysis simply used a current source model. By the same token, what becomes important is to figure out what are the boundaries of valid operation of the MOSFET in saturation. Okay, so to do that, we conducted a large signal analysis, and it had two components to it. One, of course, was to figure out output, uh, the output versus input uh, response. And what this usually does is that it does a large signal it does an analysis, a nonlinear analysis of this circuit. If it's a linear circuit, it's a linear analysis, and figures out what the values of the various voltages and currents are in the circuit as a function of the applied uh, inputs and chosen parameters. Uh, and the second step we said was to figure out valid operating ranges. for input and corresponding ranges for the other dependent parameters such as V0. Okay, you could also find out the corresponding operating range for the current IDS and so on. Okay, so by doing this, you could first analyze the circuit, find out the bias parameters, find out the uh, values of VI and V0 and so on. And then you could say, all right, provided as long as VI stays within these bounds, my assumption that this is in saturation will hold and everything will be fine. Okay, so uh, uh, the reading for this is uh, uh, chapter 8. And uh, today we'll take the next step and uh, revisit small signal analysis. So in the demo that I showed you at the end of last lecture, I showed you an input triangular wave, and that input triangular wave uh, gave rise to an output. And we noticed that we did have amplification. Okay, I had a small input, I had a much bigger output. I did have application when, uh, amplification when the MOSFET was in saturation, but it was highly nonlinear. Okay? The input was a triangular wave, and the output was some funny, you know, it, it kind of looked like a sinusoid whose tips, you know, whose uh, extremities had been whacked down and kind of flattened, and its uh, upward going peak had been shrunk. So it was kind of a weird nonlinear behavior. I'll show that to you again later on. <clears throat> and so the, the behavior, it, was, it amplified, but it was nonlinear, okay? And remember our goal of uh, two weeks ago, we set out to build a linear amplifier. Okay, so today we'll walk down that path and talk about building a linear amplifier. So to very quickly revisit the, uh, the input versus output characteristic, VI versus V0, this is VT, and uh, this is VS. Uh, this is what uh, uh, things look like. We also, uh, to quickly review the valid ranges, until some point here, uh, the amplifier was in saturation, the MOSFET was in saturation, and somewhere here, I had uh, uh, VI, uh, rather VO, being equal to VI minus the threshold drop. At that point, the MOSFET went into its triode region, and uh, I no longer was following the saturation discipline. So, therefore, this is my valid region of, uh, uh, region of operation. Uh, we also know that the output was given by Vs minus K, Vi minus Vt whole squared. Okay, again, assuming uh, the MOSFET is in saturation. Okay, it's very important to keep stating this, okay, because this is true only when the MOSFET is in saturation, when I'm following the uh, discipline. So notice that this is a nonlinear relationship. So VO depends on some funny square law uh, dependence on uh, VI. So the key 
the key here is how do we go about building our amplifier? So suppose, so take a look at this point here. So at this point here, my, let's say I have a VI input. Corresponding output is uh, V0. Focus at this point, okay? And uh, left to itself, this is a nonlinear curve. Okay, and remember the trick that we used in our nonlinear, the uh, Expo Dweeb example. We used the Zen method. Remember the Zen method? We said, hey, look, you know, this is nonlinear, but if you can focus your mind, if you can focus on this little piece of the curve here, okay, this looks more or less linear. Okay, if I look at a small itty bitty portion of the curve, you know, and do the Zen thing, okay, and kind of you know zoom in on, on here, this looks more or less linear. Okay, this means that if I could work with very small signals and apply the signal in a way that I also had a DC offset of some sort, then I would be in a region of the curve. I would uh, be delineating a small region of the curve and which would be more or less linear. Okay, this was a small signal trick. And uh, what we'll do here is simply revisit the small signal model. Okay, most of what I'm gonna do from here on will be more or less a repeat of what you saw for the uh, light emitting expo dweeb. Okay, just that here, I have a three terminal device. Okay, a little bit more complication. Uh, the equation is different. Okay, I don't have to resort to uh, a Taylor series expansion. You, um, I'll just do a complete expansion of this expression and uh, uh, develop the uh, small signal values for you. Okay, so uh, recall the small signal model. Okay, had the following steps. The first step was operate at some bias point, VIV naught, and of course, uh, some corresponding point uh, IDS. This is uh, page three. <coughs> and then uh, superimpose a small signal small signal VI on top of the big fat bias. Remember the boost? So VI is the boost. Boom. And above VI, I have a small signal VI that I apply. And our claim is that response of the amplifier to VI is Okay, so the, key, so the key trick with this is that for my small signal model here, uh, this is page three here, page two. So the key trick here is that with the small signal model, I operate my amplifier at some operating point, V naught uh, I, VI. I uh, superimpose a small signal VI on top of small VI on top of big VI. And then I claim that the response to VI is approximately linear, okay? And uh, let me just uh, embellish that uh, curve a little bit more. Notice that uh, in this situation, uh, this was my VI, which is my bias voltage. Uh, this is V naught, which is the output bias. And of course, not shown on this graph is uh, the output operating current, which is uh, IDS, okay? So one, one nice way of thinking about this is uh, to, re to redraw this and think that your coordinate axes have kind of shifted in the following manner. So uh, this is VI. This is also on your page, uh, page three. This is VT. Remember, this was your operating point, V naught and VI. And notice that we were operating in this small regime regime of our uh, transfer, transfer curve here. And in effect, what we're saying is that I'm gonna apply small variations about VI and uh, call those variations delta VI or small VI. And the resulting variations are gonna look like delta V naught, also uh, referred to as small V, small, small O. 
Okay, so I have small variations here, and they give rise to a corresponding small variations there. So one way to view this, okay, is as if we are working with a new coordinate system. Okay, another way to view this is that, so uh, the, the VI, the V capital I and V capital O uh, correspond to my VI and VO as the total voltages at, uh, in my circuit. But uh, at this bias point, I can think of another coordinate system here with small VI and small VO out there. And for small, for small changes to VI, I can figure out the small changes, corresponding small changes to VO. Just that all the analysis I performed here is going to be linear, uh, and I'll show you, uh, and I'll prove it to you uh, in a couple of different ways in, uh, uh, in the next few seconds. Okay? So uh, when I'm doing small signal analysis, I'm operating here, okay, um, in this regime at some bias point. So uh, you've also seen this before. How do I get the, uh, how do I get a bias? So this is my amplifier RL and VS. This is page four. V naught. Okay, the way I get a bias is I apply some DC voltage VI and superimpose on top of that my small signal, small VI. Okay, this is my DC bias that has boosted up the signal to, uh, uh, to an interesting value. Okay, and because of that, what I can get is by varying VI as a small signal with a very small amplitude, I'm going to get a linear response here, and, uh, and I can draw that for you as well. Okay, so this is my bias point here. And if I vary my signal like so, then my output should look like this. Okay, so this is point VI, this is point VO. Okay, and this is my small signal VI, and uh, this is my small signal VO, and this is capital VO. Okay, so this, this small thing here is VI. Um, I'd like to show you a little demo. Um, I'll start with the same demo I showed you the last time. I uh, showed you the amplifier. Apply, in the demo, I'm going to apply a, a triangular wave. And initially, I start with a large signal. Okay, and you will see that the output looks uh, really corny. It's going to look, uh, you know, something like this. Okay, that's the large signal response. And then I'll begin playing with the input, uh, making it smaller, and you can see how it looks uh, yourselves. There you go. <clears throat> so this is where I stopped the last time. And uh, in the last lecture, I applied this input. Uh, time is going to the right. And uh, the blue, the purple curve in the background is the output. Okay, it looks much more like a sinusoid with some flattening of its, uh, of its tips, nothing like a, uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, triangular wave. So what I'll do next is that let me make sure I have enough of a uh, boost here, enough of a DC voltage so that I'm operating in some, at some point here. I believe I already have that. So notice that I can shift up the triangular wave uh, input, or I can shift it down. So let me bias it here. So I've chosen a VI that's about, uh, I forget uh, how many volts per division it is, but I've uh, chosen some uh, VI here, and I've biased it such that uh, this is the input. Now what I'll do, uh, you get a nonlinear response. It's amplified. It's, it's much bigger. So what I'll do next is uh, make VI that I apply smaller and smaller. Okay, I've already done the boosting. Boom. Okay? Boom. That's a boost. Okay, so I've boosted up your VI already. Next is I'm going to shrink it, and hopefully you will see that uh, if all that I'm saying is truthful here, uh, you will see a triangular response. So let's, let's go try it out. So what's the yellow? Uh, I'm going to shrink the yellow, make it smaller and smaller. There you go. It's great when uh, nature works like uh, you expect it to. 
So I've no, I mean, I've never seen a triangular wave look so pretty in my life. It's, it's awesome. So, you know, look at this. You know, here's a tiny uh, triangular wave. Um, and uh, the output is also uh, a triangular wave. It's much more linear. Yes, question. What's that? Uh, the, the question is that, you know, your output here is only as big as the input used to be before. But that's a good, uh, that's a good question. Uh, what I've done here is I'm showing you a laboratory experiment, all right? And uh, uh, let's assume that this input is the input I'm getting from some sensor in the field. Okay, assume that this, this is my input. Okay, not, not what I had before. Okay, assume that this is my input to begin with, and uh, this is the amplified uh, output. What I can also do is I can also change the bias, and we'll see this at the end of the lecture, uh, in the last 10 minutes of lecture. Uh, how do you select a bias point? Okay, by changing your bias point, you can change the properties of an amplifier to give you a preview of upcoming attractions. All right, let me ask you. So what do you think should happen if I change the bias point? I haven't shown you the math yet, so intuitively, what do you think should happen? If I increase the bias, what do you think is going to happen? Yes. Ah, a good insight. Higher bias will be more amplification. Okay, let's see if uh, our friend is correct. Let me just change the uh, three here. Okay, here. All right. So let me set a higher bias. Not necessarily, I guess. Uh, you're actually right, by the way. Okay, I'm, I'm playing a trick on everybody here. Um, yeah, let's do that. Okay, so I'm, uh, as I change my input bias, notice that under certain conditions, my output becomes smaller, okay, and gets more distorted. Okay, under other conditions, What's going to happen to my output is that it's becoming, it's becoming smaller and it's going to get distorted again. Okay, so there are a bunch of uh, a bunch of funny effects happening that reflect on the bias point. But for for an appropriate choice of bias point, the as I increase the bias, the amplification should increase indeed increase, and I'll show you that I'll show you that in a few minutes. Yes, but a, it's a complicated relationship. Yes. This is finally getting fun. Okay, so, so, so here's the question. So, yeah, you, <laughs> Professor Agarwal, we love your song and dance, but, but if you really want to get you know, a high signal at the output and you want to amplify a big input signal, how do you do it, right? So uh, the question is, let's say I have an input that's this big here. If it's this big, I've shown you how I can get things that this, that's this big. But what if my input was this big? How do I get an output that this, that's this big? Well, I'll use the... Uh, uh, yeah, one of those uh, uh, learn by questioning methods, and uh, have you tell me the answer? So, uh, someone tell me the answer. How do I do that? Yes. Use another amplifier. So the, the answer is uh, okay. So I use one amplifier to go from here to here. Okay, and th and the suggestion is use another amplifier to go from here to here. And in fact, I believe that you may have a problem in your problem set where you will do that. Okay? And uh, so how do you... Uh, so uh, you have only yourselves to blame. All right. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, how do you, so how do you make this work? What you have to do is this VI, this VI has to be much smaller than the bias point VI on this one. I have to build a different amplifier, choose a different set of parameters such that VI prime, which is the VI for this guy, is much less than V capital I prime for this guy. It's, it's a design question. Okay, you need to design it in a way that the signals of interest need to be much smaller than the bias voltage of this amplifier. So, it's, it, so you may have to use much higher supply voltages. Uh, my amplifier, I believe, has a 4-volt supply, a 5-volt supply. You may have to use an amplifier with a much bigger supply, different values of RL and so on. Okay, and I know that the uh, course notes also has some exercises and problem sets that uh, dis discuss that in more detail. Yes. So why do you need the middle step with the first amplifier anyway? Why do you need to just plug um, the supply? 
this is e this is even more fun. Uh, so the question is, the question is, good question. So the question is, why do you need this guy here? Dump him. Just use this guy. Right? Why do you need this guy? You know, uh, big guys rule, right? Who needs the little guys? Well, let me use the uh, Socratic method again. Why don't you give me the answer? <laughs> you guys are smart. So uh, why do you need little guys? Why do you need the small guy here? Anybody with the answer? Yeah. The big guy may not be as sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. You know, I, I, you know what? He's almost correct. Hey, I'll show you why in a second. Anything else? Any other? Any other reason? Any other reason? Yes. Yes. Bingo. That's another good answer. Okay, so let me address both the answers. The, the answer given was that, look, this amplifier is amplifying the signal by a certain amount, by a factor of seven. Okay, and I've designed this such that this amplifies the signal by a factor of maybe uh, a factor of maybe ten. So in all, I'm getting an amplification of seventy. Okay, this would be a great design question for lab for next year. You know, I, I give you a bunch of components and ask you to design an amplifier given the constraints with the highest amount of amplification. It, it, it turns out that uh, when you design your amplifier, in order to meet the saturation discipline and so on, you have to choose values of RL and VS and stuff like that and be within power constraints, okay? So the amplifier doesn't blow up and stuff. And by the end of it all, you're gonna get a measly 7X gain out of it. Same way here, to be able to deal with a very small signal here and get some amplification and other sort of values, Okay, and uh, you get 10x. Okay, so the f they multiply. It's much harder to build one amplifier with a much larger gain. And you know what? I just realized, uh, we'll be looking at this in the last five or seven minutes of lecture. I'm gonna show you what the amplification depends upon. Depends upon K, depends upon RL, depends upon VI. Okay, now the question is, uh, I've, I've had all this time to think about how to stitch in sensitive into this, and I, and I believe I can. So, uh, so it turns out that uh, when you have large voltages and so on, and uh, you have the practical devices. Turns out that the more current you pump through devices, uh, they, they, they tend to produce noises, produce noise of various kinds, okay? So very powerful amplifiers are not very good at dealing with very really tiny signals because they have some inherent noise uh, capabilities, okay? And so uh, I guess that is uh, sensitive, you know, it's sensitive to noise. So, uh, okay, uh, another question? Yes. Um, ask me the question again, I, I didn't follow. If we, have, if we have something the size of the middle signal, why would you want to bump it so we can pass it through a weaker amplifier and then pass it to the big amplifier again when we can just pass it straight to the big amplifier to begin with? So yeah. I'll just explain. It turns out that uh, um, I will not be able to pass it to the big amplifier to begin with because uh, this may give me a, a gain of just a factor of seven. Okay? So. Uh, However, if I have a signal that's this big to begin with, then I may just need this amplifier. I don't need the smaller guy. If, if my signal was this big to begin with, if I had a strong sensor, okay, that produced a strong signal to begin with, yeah, I, I can deal with just, just a single stage. I don't need two stages. Okay, it's, it's all a matter of design. And it's actually a fun design exercise, you know, given, uh, given a budget, dollars, Right? Given, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, you go to, you go to your supply room and look at the parts that you have, and you go to build what you have to build with the parts that you have, right? And so sometimes you, can, you, need, you need to build two amplifiers to get the gain, or build a single amplifier. It's all the design thing, okay? All right. So moving on to page seven. So that brings us to the small signal model. Some, uh, page five. All right. 
So, uh, so what I showed you up on the uh, uh, little demo was that provided the signal input, okay, in, in this example, VI was much smaller than capital VI uh, out there as I shrank my input, uh, I was able to get a more or less linear response at the output, okay? And so uh, to re repeat my notation uh, at the input, the total input is a sum of the operating point input plus the small signal input. Okay, this is called the total variable. This is called the DC bias. It's also called the uh, operating point voltage. And this is called uh, my small signal input. Uh, it's also variously called incremental input. Okay, this is more a mathematical term uh, relating to uh, incremental analysis or perturbation analysis. Okay, so VI, you call it small signal, call it small perturbation, call it uh, increment, whatever you want. Similarly, at the output, I have my uh, total variable at the output is a sum of the output operating voltage and the small signal uh, voltage. I don't like using uh, O's in, uh, in symbols because you know, big O and small O uh, is simply a function of how, how big you write them. It's not super, not super clear. Okay, and uh, in terms of a graph, let me plot the input and output for you. So let's say this is the total input, and that is the total uh, output. So I may have some bias VI, and corresponding to that, I may have some bias VO. Okay, um, uh, hold that thought for a second while I uh, uh, give you a preview of something that we will be covering in a, uh, in, in a couple, in about three or four weeks. Notice that as I couple amplifiers together, the output operating point voltage of this amplifier, okay, in this connection, becomes the input operating point voltage of this amplifier, right? So the output, when I connect this output to this input, the output operating point voltage becomes coupled to the input here, so it becomes input operating point voltage here. So now I have a nightmare on my hands. You know, as I adjust the bias of this guy, so, uh, the bias of this guy changes too. The two are dependent. It's a pain in the neck. And we being engineers find ways to simplify our lives. And you will learn another trick in about three or four weeks. And that trick will let you decouple these two stages in a way that you can, you can design this stage in isolation. Okay, go have a cup of coffee, then come back to this stage and design this stage in isolation. Okay, uh, for those of you who want to run ahead and think about how to do it, uh, think about it. Okay, how do you design, uh, what trick can you use to get them in isolation? Okay. <clears throat> uh, moving on, <clears throat> what I'd like to do next is uh, um, address this uh, from a mathematical point of view, and much as I did for the uh, light emitting export dweeb, analyze this uh, mathematically and show you that if VI is much smaller than capital VI, I indeed get a linear response. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> this time around, I won't use Taylor series. It turns out that this expression can be expanded fully. Okay, so you don't have to, uh, you know, buy into Taylor series and so on. You just, I'm going to list everything down for you. So we know, <clears throat> to begin with, that uh, VO for the amplifier is Vs RL K divided by 2, Vi minus Vt whole squared. Okay, what I'm going to do is, <clears throat> much as I did for the LED, um, what I'm going to do for this is derive for you the output as a function of the input when the input VI is very small. Okay, in other words, when I substitute for VI, V capital I plus small VI. Okay, much as I did for the uh, export dweeb, uh, I want to substitute for VI a big v DC VI. So uh, VI is much smaller than 
vi. All right, and show you for yourselves that the output response v small o is going to be linearly connected to vi. <clears throat> so uh, notice that. Um, let me write another equation here. This is the total variable. Okay, this simply says that if the input is vi, then the output is going to be vo, which means that the operating point input voltage should satisfy this equation, correct? So in other words, the operating point output voltage V capital O should equal Vs minus RLK divided by 2, Vi minus Vt whole squared. This is at uh, Vi equals capital Vi. Okay, this is um, very simple but may seem confusing. All this is saying is that, look, this equation gives me the relationship between Vi and V0. Therefore, if I apply capital VI as the input, okay, I'm given that my corresponding output is capital V0, so they must satisfy this equation, right? Those are bias point values, and that must satisfy this equation. Simple. Okay, I know that. So uh, hold that thought. Okay, stash it away in the back of your minds. Okay, now, now let me go through a bunch of grubby math <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, <clears throat> substitute for vi this expression here. So uh, let me go ahead and do that. Vs minus rl k two when I do something that's other than math, you know, I'll wake you up, okay? Uh, so I'll, I'll just keep doing a bunch of steps that's pure math, okay? No cheating, no nothing, wash my fingers. But when I do anything that's not obvious math, I'll, uh, I'll wake you up, okay? So this is, uh, next I'm going to simply move VT over and rewrite this as follows, RL K by 2, VI minus VT plus VI. Again, I haven't done anything, anything interesting so far. Just, I've just substituted this. I'm just juggling things around, you know, just to pass, to while away some time, I guess. All right. <clears throat> uh, next, what I'm going to do is simply expand this out, right, and write it this way, uh, RLK by 2. Expand that out and uh, treat this as one unit. squared plus twice plus v yeah, i squared. Okay? Nothing fancy here. So this is like the honest board. Okay? There's nothing fancy here. Standard stuff. Only math. <coughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll move to this, uh, uh, this blackboard here uh, where I do some uh, fun uh, EE stuff. Okay, yes. Good, at least one person ain't asleep here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, the, the, uh, so, just math here, nothing, nothing fancy, plain old simple math. Okay, I haven't done no trickery. I, I still have all my 10 fingers, you know. Okay, now what I'm going to do. Now watch me. <clears throat> so I'm not using Taylor series here because this expression lends itself to this analysis. <clears throat> Notice uh, VI is squared here. I made the assumption that VI is much smaller than capital VI. Okay, so what I can do is if, assuming that VT is small enough that VI minus VT is still a big number compared to small VI, what I can do is ignore this in comparison to the capital VI terms. Okay, so I have a capital VI term here. Okay, I'm going to ignore VI squared. So for example, if VI was, capital VI was 5 volts, and small VI was 100 millivolts, 0.1. Okay, so 0.1 squared is 0.01, so it's comparing 0.01 to 5. So I'm off by a factor of 500, so you know. So now watch me, okay? It's now uh, I begin, uh, you know, uh, playing some fun and games here. So I, I, I eliminate this, and because I eliminate that, 
uh, it now becomes uh, uh, approximately equal. Uh, what I do in addition is let me write down the output. The total variable is sum of uh, uh, the, DC the DC bias and the uh, uh, some variation in the output. And let me simply write down, expand that term and write it down again. Minus RL k divided by 2 vi minus vt uh, whole squared. Okay, and I get a minus RL k divided by 2. I get a 2 here. And I get uh, vi minus vt. I won't forget the vi this time. <clears throat> okay. Um, again, from here to there, nothing, nothing fancy. This is the one, one step where I've used the trick. I've said vi is much smaller than capital vi, and so I've simply expanded this out and written it here. So do you see the obvious next trick here? So uh, from star, look at this guy. Okay, from star, I can cancel this out from star because I know that at the operating point, these two expressions are equal, and so therefore I can cancel out the operating point voltage uh, and this. What I'm left with is small v naught is simply RL minus RLK VI minus VT times small VI. Okay, only one place, okay, where I did something uh, funny. Other than that, it's purely math. <clears throat> so this is what I get. So notice that this whole thing is a constant, minus RL, K, V, I, V, T, this whole thing is a constant, okay? And so V naught is equal to some constant times V, I. <clears throat> Let me just define some uh, terms for you that we'll use again and again. For reasons that will be obvious, uh, next lecture, okay? I'm going to call this term here GM. So I'm going to call this term, K, this is a constant, K V I minus V T. It's a constant for a given operating, for a given bias point voltage, okay? So uh, I'm going to call that GM. And then I'm going to call this whole thing A, and of course this is V I. There you go. I have my linear amplifier. A is the gain times small vi. And the gain has these terms in it. I just call this gm. Uh, you'll see why later. But notice that the gain relates to rl, the size of the, size of the load resistor, rl, the, uh, how, how, how uh, big it is, 1k, 10k, whatever. k, this is a MOSFET parameter and VI minus VT. Okay, that's a constant for a given bias point voltage and small VI. So V naught equals small VI. So uh, I won't give you a, uh, a graphical uh, interpretation, but uh, I encourage you to go and look at figure 8.9 in the course notes, and it gives you a graphical interpretation of uh, that expression. <clears throat> okay, move to page seven. So another way of looking at this So another way of uh, mathematically analyzing it. So here I went through kind of a full-blown expansion and you know, uh, pretty much deriving the small signal response. Uh, what I can also do is uh, take a shortcut here. So let me just give you the shortcut. Uh, you may find this handy. Vs minus k r l divided by two. <clears throat> and my shortcut is as follows. My small signal response is simply this relationship. Okay, I find the slope of the uh, slope at the point capital VI and multiply by the increment. 
Okay. Slope times the increment gives me the incremental change in V naught as follows. So uh, d by di vs minus k rl2 evaluated at vi equals capital vi times small vi. Right, this is good old math again. Um, so I want to find out the change in V naught for a small change in VI, and I do that by taking the uh, first derivative of this with respect to VI, substituting V capital I, and multiplying by the small change del uh, uh, delta VI or small VI. So this is simply the slope, slope of the V naught versus VI curve at VI. Okay, and so therefore. Uh, Taking the derivative here uh, of this, you know, this is a constant, so it vanishes. So twice, two into cancel out, so I get K R L V I minus V T times small V I evaluated at capital V I. Okay, so I get uh, twice K R L twice um, V I evaluated at capital V I, so it's V I minus V T times small V I. Same thing. Oh, I have a minus sign here. Okay, I get the same expression that I derived for you out there, and this is just using, uh, you know, the uh, taking the slope and uh, and going with it. And this, as I mentioned before, this is a. So in the last few minutes, uh, let me kind of pull everything together and uh, also you know, hit upon something that many of your questions uh, touched upon, and that all relates to how to choose the bias point. So here I've, an, I've taken an analysis approach, okay? When teaching, we often teach the, you know, here's something, you're given something, you analyze it. But as you begin to master it, you can begin to uh, design things where you can ask what if questions and so on. And here, what we have is an analysis given a value of RL, K, K, VI, and so on. Um, how to choose a bias point become more of a design issue. Now, if, if you're designing an amplifier, okay, you ask me the question, you know, how do I choose two small amplifiers versus one, one big amplifier, you know, that sort of stuff. So it, it boils down to how do you choose the bias point, okay? Um, how do you choose VI? How do you choose RL? And so on. So what I'd like to do is uh, touch upon some of these things. Uh, first of all, gain, or uh, the amplification. <coughs> One of the most important design parameters for an amplifier is what's the gain? Okay, uh, you go out to, uh, uh, let's say you get a job at Maxim Integrated Technologies, and they say, you know, well, we'd like you to build a linear power amplifier for cell phones. You can say, I know, I know that. And I know how to do that. And then they say, okay, we, we, you know, uh, the next stage needs uh, 100 millivolt input, while this thing coming from your antenna is only, you know, uh, a few tens, a few hundreds of a microvolt. So you sit down and say, oh my gosh, I need an amplification of uh, so much. And you go design an amplifier. So gain tends to be a key parameter. And notice that gain is proportional to uh, is proportional to RL. It relates to VI minus VT. Okay, so uh, proportional to VI. Okay, it's also related to uh, RL. <coughs> the second point is the gain point determines where I bias something. Okay? If I choose my bias too high, I get distortion. Uh, or if I choose my bias too low, I get distortion. So, so depending on how I choose my bias point, as the signal goes up, it may begin clipping or, or may begin distorting. And I'll show you a demo uh, uh, the next time on, uh, on that particular example. So uh, bias point will determine you know, how, how, how big of a signal you can send without getting too much distortion. Okay, and the other thing is that relates to how big of an input 
what's a valid input range? So let's say you have a signal and you want that signal to have both positive and neg negative excursions of the same value, then uh, your input range, depending on where you choose a bias point, your input range may become smaller or larger. And uh, we'll go through these in the context of our amplifier and uh, look at some design issues in the next lecture.